Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about weight loss and surgery. We're thrilled to have with us with us today Dr. Mark Zare, board certified general surgeon, fellowship trained in laparoscopic surgery and bariatric surgery. And we're going to talk all about all these issues. And we have with us Dr. Mary Varkey, who's in internal medicine uh, from India, a doctor, and she's going to ask us questions as well. Um, so, Dr. Zari, tell us what is all that we need to know about weight loss surgery, the history, what do we know? Thank you, uh, Gloria. Thanks for inviting me to your show. Uh, bariatric surgery is essentially an operation uh, that's produced or done to, in order to bring about weight loss. That is the primary objective of, uh, uh, of this procedure. However, the main uh, outcome that we are interested in as clinicians is also improving people's health, as opposed to, for example, cosmetic operations where you, you are more focused on the appearance. Uh, the field is actually not new, although the uh, fame and the uh, public awareness of it is uh, relatively new. It's been around for over 60 years. We've been doing bariatric surgery since the late uh, 1950s. Um, if you look at the history of bariatric surgery, it's uh, quite an interesting one. We uh, began doing uh, um, bariatric surgery by a procedure that we no longer even discuss. It's called jejunal ileal bypass. Um, we learned quite a bit from that procedure. We learned that uh, it is possible to perform surgery on the digestive system and induce weight loss, so that was definitely a positive. But we also learned that we can produce a lot of derangements and unwanted side effects. Like uh, nutritional problems, malnutrition, dumping. Correct. And so that was in the 60s, University of Iowa. And then it progressed more. Yes, so uh, the first procedure actually caused so many problems that uh, it was quickly abandoned. It caused liver damage and uh, things of that nature, but uh, following that procedure in the 1960s at the University of Iowa, there was an interesting observation, which was that when procedures were being done on the stomach for stomach cancer, a lot of patients ended up losing a lot of weight subsequent to the procedure. So the researchers decided that the model of removing a portion of the stomach potentially could be used for simply inducing weight loss. That's where the second procedure called gastric bypass came, came about. Um, that procedure to this date is actually a procedure that we, we use commonly. Um, we have since improved and come up with um, alternatives, and we can discuss that, but maybe I can uh, draw I'll for you us. how yeah. it was yeah. done. So in the 1960s, um, a researcher called Dr. Ed Mason came up with the concept, the first concept uh, of gastric bypass. So what he did was he took the stomach and as you can see the stomach is connected at the bottom to the small intestines. He first took it uh, at the top and divided the stomach in a very horizontal way and he brought the small intestine connected it to that um, top portion of the stomach. So you had this small bowel coming and connecting to that top portion of the stomach, which was, by the way, separated from the bottom portion. What this procedure did for those patients is that it gave them a very small stomach pouch. Therefore, the capacity to eat big meals was taken away from them. It also produced this diversion of the food away from parts of the gut that normally receive the food in the first instance. That caused a, a, a malnutrition called malabsorption, yes. which was intentional. He actually wanted to give patients two ways, two modalities to lose weight through smaller stomach, decreased capacity, but also malabsorption so to get rid of some the food. of the nutrients, potentially unwanted nutrients like excess fat, would not get absorbed. There were some problems with the original concept. This portion of the stomach stretches very easily and the fact that the bowel was brought in a shape of a loop meant that a lot of bile would come in, circulate through the stomach and cause what we call bile reflux. So 
that procedure has since been modified to what we now know as Ruan Y gastric bypass, which is essentially a modification of the original concept. Here, instead of going across in a horizontal way, we actually go vertically. This portion of the stomach doesn't stretch as easily. So that's been an improvement. And the other thing that's been done is no longer a loop of bowel is brought up. Instead, we do something called Ruan Y, which we don't have to go into the details. But this anatomy then prevents bile from coming up and circulating into the stomach. This is currently the procedure that about 20% of patients in this country receive. It has, um, in a way, uh, stood the test of time because it's very effective, and uh, especially when it's done through the minimally invasive approach, it's very safe. However, because it's still a big departure from the way nature has uh, created the digestive system, um, it is associated with some unwanted side effects. And so as time went by, we experimented with new concepts. And so this was 1960s, 70s. Um, we came up with other procedures that no longer exist. We can skip through some of those. In the, uh, in the 80s, there was a procedure called vertical banded gastroplasty, which did not really do much to the intestine, the small intestine. And the main, main uh, concept there was um, let's just partition the stomach into two components again and put a band across the lower portion. Anytime the idea of a foreign object on the, directly placed on the stomach is introduced, you get into the issues of uh, foreign objects uh, eroding and causing infection and so on. And this took many m operations as well. You had to go many yeah. times. So, to... so this was the, this procedure had, uh, again, long-term unwanted side effects requiring procedures to go back and uh, potentially undoing some of the work that was originally done. But it led to yet another operation called gastric banding. Now, gastric banding um, had its uh, moment in the late 90s and up to about 10, 15 years ago. What that operation entailed was just simply putting a silastic band, which would then be inflated through a pump inserted underneath the skin. The concept was quite novel. It sounded uh, minimal, and so there was a lot of interest in that. But just like the history of uh, previous procedures in which foreign objects had been placed on the gut were not really one of success, this procedure too had its um, run for about 10, 15 years, and it resulted in unwanted side effects. This plastic, silastic ring would move, would cause issues, even though it is soft and it's inflatable and deflatable, and technically a reversible operation, um, over half of the individuals who receive it ended up requiring it to be removed. So like many things in science, we learn from our mistakes, and we decided that um, it's best to avoid foreign objects. It's best to look at history and see what has worked. And so uh, in, in the period, I would say, uh, in, the, um, in the last 10, 15 years again, uh, in early 2000s, we came up with yet another procedure that we're quite excited about. And this is the procedure that we currently offer as the predominant procedure. Over 70% of Americans currently in 2018 um, receive it. We call it vertical sleeve gastrectomy, or, horizon, uh, or um, simply sleeve gastrectomy. What we do here is we take the stomach and we turn it into a long vertical tube.
and then remove the excess portion that is separated from that. And this you do with small instruments placed in the abdomen, so you don't make a big incision. Correct. So the big transition occurred in the early 1990s. Almost everything we did in general surgery was being experimented on in that we had this new, new approach to performing general Laparoscope. surgery called laparoscopic mm -hmm. surgery or minimally invasive surgery. The concept there was instead of creating big incisions, let's, let's just make tiny small incisions, place a telescope and project the, uh, the, the, the contents on a screen and through these tiny incisions uh, do everything we could. And so from the 1990s on, uh, literally every operation from a simple removal of the appendix, gallbladder, all the way to more complex procedures were experimented on and uh, now it's a well-established uh, and uh, really the preferred method of performing a lot of our operations, including bariatric surgery, so much so that um, it's really the standard of care and it's no longer acceptable to perform an open uh, bariatric procedure. So this sleeve surgery is popular simply because the stomach connects to the small intestine like normal. Yes. You don't reconnect the small intestine. There's yes. no other stuff to rearrange the gut. And you're making the stomach physically smaller. Yes, so it's unique in exactly in the ways that you describe, in, in, in that what's left of uh, a patient's anatomy is really as close as we've, we've ever come, uh, up, come up with in terms of being um, natural, being, uh, being the way our gut uh, likes to handle food. So here, food enters, stays in the stomach for a while instead of being dumped directly into the small bowel. Why does it stay in there? Well, because nat nature's given us a little valve at the bottom of the stomach to regulate the emptying of the stomach. And so we don't touch that, we leave that alone. That's a big plus. The fact that the stomach is created on its, what you see on the left of the screen, the thicker, more um, muscular part of the stomach means that it's not going to stretch easily. So it stands the, um, the test of uh, time. Oh, so it stays small, stays like the tube, so correct, it cannot correct. enlarge. And it has about a capacity of about four to five ounces. That is the, essentially the size of a meal that an individual who receives this procedure will be consuming three, four times a day, small meals. And you might ask yourself, okay, is that going to be enough? Is that, how is that easy to, to live with? That, there comes the second part of this procedure, a second uh, set of tools that the procedure provides you, and that is what we call metabolic benefits. Things that don't, you don't quite see by looking at the procedure, but we know occur in the bloodstream. We are talking about changes in the hormones, and these changes, totally called metabolic changes, are responsible for patients' appetite, for example, being reduced or sense of fullness or satiety being elevated. So in spite of eating a small meal, very interestingly, patients feel as satisfied, if not more satisfied, than someone eating a large, very big meal. So the interesting part about this is that you leave the anatomy of the stomach, you just cut off part of the stomach. So the chemical functions of the stomach remain, and therefore the sites of the hormones release are also the same. So that's more physiologic. So, yes, so we leave behind enough stomach for absorbing, for, for receiving food and handling it and processing it. Yet by removing the portion, the 75% or so of the stomach, we are removing parts, we are removing cells that produce an, a hormone called ghrelin, for example, which is uh, a, an appetite hormone. By, that hormone is usually made in the upper portions of the stomach. Removal of this part of the stomach then results in suppression of ghrelin hormone, which will last forever, and that allows patients to get rid of that excess hunger many of them have that leads to uh, gaining weight to begin with. We also see other changes um, in, in this procedure with hormones that come from other portions of the digestive system. We have hormones like peptide YY, GLP-1. These hormones 
also influence a uh, sense of fullness or even how much blood sugar uh, your body has. So that becomes relevant for diabetics. Again, by affecting the way the digestive system handles food, we can influence these hormones indirectly. And uh, as a result, patients not only lose weight, they improve that sense of fullness, satiety, decrease hunger, so that goes along with um, an increased quality of life. Um, and they improve diabetes or now, resolve diabetes. You had said something off the set that um, the success rates are quite high. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so we define success as far as weight loss. We define it if, as um, being able to lose and keep the weight off. Um, and in, in terms of numbers, that is at least half of the excess weight a person carries. So if a person is 100 pounds overweight, what is success defined by your Society of Bariatric Surgeons? So if you lose over and keep that weight, over, over 50 pounds out of the 100, that's generally considered a very successful intervention. You have to remember that the alternative is just simply dieting and exercising. And although that sounds good, that's a big challenge for someone who's carried 100 pounds throughout his or her adult life, right? And so in the world of dieting and exercise, typically only about 5%, just 5% of patients are able to lose and maintain the weight that they've lost for various reasons, they lose, they gain, they lose, and they gain. Um, here, and the amount of weight that they can lose with just dieting is typically in the range of five to eight percent. So to be able to lose over 50 to 60 percent, keep it off, that's truly um, a te testament to, of course, the patient's uh, willingness to change lifestyle, but also the tools that these procedures offer them. So one more thing. Um, uh, since you were talking about all these procedures, yes. I would like to know, like, when can a patient, like, suppose if I'm a patient who is thinking about bariatric surgery, so when should I ideally decide about going for a surgery? Good question. So we generally consider these options as uh, options to be considered after mm -hmm. a patient has attempted losing weight by non-surgical modalities. So you have mm -hmm. to diet at least mm -hmm. once or twice genuinely mm -hmm. uh, for a length of time and be convinced, your physician, but also you have to be convinced mm -hmm. that the, those inventions did not work for you. We also make sure that patients at least carry a certain amount of excess weight. We look at your weight, your height, do an, a, a determination of what's called a body mass index, which mm -hmm. is just a number, mm -hmm. the normal being 20 to 25. Mm -hmm. And we want the patient to have at least a body mass index of 35. Uh, if, especially if they have diabetes and health problems, and if they have none of those health issues, simply they have excess weight, then at least a BMI of 40. Roughly, in terms of pounds, that's about 80 to 100 extra pounds. Okay, so you, you were talking about the other benefits of having the bariatric surgery, because yes. most of them think that once you have the surgery, it's only the weight which is getting lost. So you, you were talking about diabetes, so your sugars get controlled as well, and any other medical uh, you know, complications which are reduced by this? Yes. So, uh, uh, generally speaking, a lot of patients who have that 80 or 100 excess pounds, mm -hmm. they have what we call metabolic syndrome, a, mm -hmm. a, a number of conditions that's associated or directly caused by their excess weight. So it only makes sense to then see those conditions one by one disappear as the weight goes off. That's the, that's the whole concept here. So what are those conditions? Diabetes or insulin resistance or prediabetes, a spectrum of conditions mm -hmm. where your blood sugar is not being handled normally. You have high blood pressure, very common uh, in our society, increased cholesterol in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. obstructive sleep apnea, yep. and a whole host of musculoskeletal problems like osteoarthritis, lower back pain, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And the list is quite long. We could, we could continue talking about things that are not really well known, but in the medical societies, we really are concerned about. Fatty liver is one of those conditions. The leading cause for liver damage in, in this country is currently not alcoholic liver disease or viruses causing liver damage. It's actually fatty liver. And there's really no other treatment for it than mm -hmm. losing all the excess weight you have. Now, the most most demographic studies show that um, 
women do this more than men, this procedure. That's true. However, if you look at obesity, it's like 60% women and 40% men. So still overwhelmingly women do it. So what are the youngest people? You told me that adolescents sometimes get this, you know, over age 16. Yes, uh, they do. Yeah. So that was a surprise to me, and I'm an MD. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, well, we can talk about age first. As far as age goes, uh, generally speaking, uh, in the adult world, we offer this procedure to anyone 18 uh, and above, and the uh, upper age limit is generally in the, in the range of seven, 75. So there's a wide spectrum of age that we offer this to. The adolescents uh, are a unique challenge. You, uh, as a parent, obviously, mm -hmm. you don't want to be making li life-changing life decisions that uh, may not be the decision that the child uh, wants later on. However, you want them to have a normal um, adolescent life and go on to be normal adults as far as uh, weight and health is concerned. And that's where, under very um, uh, careful conditions in, in institutions that are certified to be adolescent bariatric uh, centers, uh, it, this procedure can make a big difference in psychology of the child who's lived with obesity all his or her life and also the health. Uh, we are seeing these liver damages and health issues, the hypertension and so on, in young children, and that's clearly not a good thing. So once yeah. if I've decided to go for the surgery, so should I, pre as a patient, should I do some pre-op preparations or something for the surgery? Yes, in fact, we pay quite a bit of attention to that pre-operative process. Okay. Um, selection of the right patient is ultimately the, probably the most important thing as a, mm -hmm. as a surgeon. We have to pay attention to what patients have done before, mm -hmm. what type of support structure they have. Do they understand what this is all about? Mm -hmm. Are they truly motivated to change lifestyle if it's required to be changed? And so on and so forth. So we spend uh, months at a time on each patient mm -hmm. uh, going through these questions, trying to answer them, providing them the support they need, and also um, there are some requirements that typically are uh, in, you know, inclusive of seeing a dietitian uh, a few times, a psychologist sometimes mm -hmm. is required to um, assess patients' uh, ability to fully comprehend and uh, withstand the, the changes that are coming their way. And sometimes even if their dietary intervention is not considered adequate, we, we ask them to um, go through a structured diet program and see how they do with that before we commit to surgery. So the options are given to the patient to choose from, different type of procedures? Uh, so as far as procedures go, my mm -hmm. personal philosophy is every procedure is very unique. And mm -hmm. um, we have to educate patients about um, essentially what differentiates, for example, the sleeve mm -hmm. from the, its predecessors. Why is it that it is so popular and uh, well perceived by, by us? Uh, and once we educate them, of course, they have mm -hmm. the choice to pick uh, what makes Which most money. sense yeah. to them. Now, insurance covers it, but there's a pre-approval or authorization process, and part of that includes their doing a diet uh, That's correct. process. Do they have to keep a journal or see a dietitian or an internist? What do they do typically? Yes, it's actually quite a um, well-scrutinized process in that insurance companies um, they are very strict and very um, uh, clear about what they need. If each policy is typically different, uh, written differently, and it includes, um, you know, going through a specified period of time, typically three to six months, of uh, being under the supervision of a physician or a dietitian, during which time they have to keep uh, food journals, they have to uh, attempt to lose weight, they have to exercise, they have to change behaviors that may be contributing and all these have to be documented and sent to the insurance company for verification. So. Do, you, do you ever get uh, prospective brides who say, I want to lose this weight before a wedding and help me, and then what? Um, interestingly, I have had that. <laughs> we tend to um, educate individuals that this is really not a short-term goal. You shouldn't really just lose weight for an event, although that's understandably an important event and we want to help individuals get to their goals no matter what the goal is but it's nice to see beyond that it's nice to have a plan that mm -hmm. 
um, can stay with you, its results can stay with you even beyond an event, a night, a day. Uh, but yes, I've had that and uh, it's yet another reason to, to consider weight loss surgery. So seeing you talk, it seems like we have to do, the patient has to do a lot after getting the surgery, like be motivated, follow strict dietary rest. Do you have any dietary restrictions? So the traditional thinking was that there would mm -hmm. be a lot of requirements and now with the procedures having gone uh, towards the sleeve mm -hmm. and the most natural outcomes. Um, the do's and don'ts is actually a short, sh much shorter mm -hmm. list than it used to be. But yes, meals are smaller. Mm -hmm. um, the choice of food is the healthiest food one mm -hmm. can find, a natural, well-prepared, um, trying to avoid eating out, added sugar, and so on. So overall, yes, there are requirements in improving lifestyle, mm -hmm. but patients pretty much live a normal life. They eat three, four times a day like everybody else. They eat healthy snacks, uh, mostly vegetables and proteins, and that's pretty much what it comes down to. Now we're coming to the end, we have to wrap up. So if we had a take home message, and there are three things to tell us about weight loss and surgery. So number one is that it's possible, minimally invasive, and it's more natural now with the sleeve operation, but it takes six months of prep time. That's true, well put. So, Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Zari, for jo joining us and Dr. Varki. Thank you. And if you like this in the home audience, donate to KSAR TV, Saratoga Access Television, and join us again. We have a uh, YouTube channel. You can put in Health Talk, Gloria Wu, and you'll find the show. Or just uh, you can also put in Dr. Zare's name and type in bariatric surgery and weight loss surgery. Thank you for joining us.